Well, thank you for being here. I know it's the last day, two o'clock. So um, I really appreciate your presence here. Um, my name is Annie Lai, and um, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit. I am I'm the chair of Generative AI Commons, and uh, I'm presenting uh, with Murray Joyce from um, representing Open Source Initiative. Okay, I'm going to first. I'm going to introduce the organization I'm rep uh, representing, Generative AI Commons. Um, have you heard of? Who has not heard of Generative AI Commons? Raise your hand. Okay. So Generative AI Commons was created to help advance the development and innovation of generative AI technologies. And we have over 200 active members um, from over 80 organizations. It is a place for um, thought leadership building as well as a platform for collaboration doing open source projects. And it is volunteer based. We have uh, several work streams and each work stream is led by some uh, volunteer as leaders. And um, it's, uh, we subscribe to open membership. In other words, you don't have to work for a company that's part of Linux Foundation to participate or contribute. So anybody in the world is welcome. And we currently have four work streams right now. The first one is called MAD, representing uh, models application data. So we work on projects in this space. And currently we're building a Gen AI landscape. And later we're gonna build um, a reference architecture, solution stack, and ecosystem. And the next one is um, framework. Um, currently, we um, you've heard of MOF this week. Several people have been talking about MOF, Model Openness Framework. And I'm gonna get into it a little bit more later. And that's, um, we created this framework is to show, to help model producers to be very transparent about how open their models are. And then this is also f uh, an opportunity for model users to know exactly what they're using. And next work stream is education outreach. And uh, in this work stream, we de develop a lot of blogs, white papers, thought leadership, you know, um, uh, webinars, and um, we also publish a glossary. So just go to genaicommons.org website. You'll be, be able to see all these um, materials that we produce. Last but not least, um, we all know that Gen AI is happening so fast. Ever since ChatGPT was announced in November 2022, and almost every, you know, every day there's some news, right? Every couple of weeks you get a bigger, faster, more capable model showing up. And you know, while we're developing so, um, Gen AI so fast, we should also think about being responsible. And some people call what we're going through is an AI Oppenheimer time, right? We are innovate, we are creating some, you know, big innovation. And if we're not careful, it can change our society, change our life in a negative way. So in this work stream, we're currently developing a responsible AI framework. And in this framework, we talked about, you know, all the um, different various dimensions that uh, makes responsible AI. So today's talk is about openness. Why it's so important to promote openness in Gen AI. It's because uh, from a development standpoint, openness fosters innovation, it helps democratize access, it accelerate, accelerate learning, and, and it also it'll help with the sustaining of sustainability of open source um, Gen AI projects. Because when everything's open, that means everybody in the world can use it, contribute, participate, distribute. And from a adoption standpoint, openness um, promotes transparency, trustworthy, because when you have transparency, it you know, leads to trust, and trust leads to adoption. So this is why it's important to support openness in AI. And this is an example um, from Stanford, you know, Stanford University. They have this program called Center for Research on Foundation Models, and um, in which they developed the Foundation Model Transparency Index. And they, what they did is they, um, they evaluate uh, over a, t a dozen top foundation models out there and score them against uh, over 100 indicators to show how transparent they are. And transparency is actually different from openness. Um, later I'll explain the difference. But basically it's uh, if the information is available. So the information is actually um, provided by model producers um, voluntarily. And then the program itself is gonna you know, uh, score them 
uh, based on the indicators. As you can see, there's no foundation model that's 100% transparent. So this, that means there's room for us to you know, work towards to. And then you still see a lot of red, that means they're not you know, very transparent, even though a lot of times um, from a marketing standpoint, they say, yeah, we are open, you know, we support open models. But if you go deeper, you know, what does that mean when they say open? And so this shows you some you know, transparency. So transparency is different from openness, like I said, especially the way we look at openness from an open source um, community standpoint. When we say open, we go with OSI's definition of openness, right? Uh, the free, which is based on the four freedoms, freedom to, you know, to learn, to use, to distribute, to share. And um, so, and then, when, and then we also have licenses. Um, open OSI has this definition, open source license, which has served us very well for the last 26 plus years. And we are, oh, that is the authority and we are following that. So when we look at openness, we look at these models, we look for the license that they use for the source code. And if they are not using OSI approved license, you know, it doesn't really meet our requirement as being truly open. So, um, so unfortunately, there's a lot of open washing going on. You know, even the biggest open model out there claim they claim open, but if you look at their uh, license, it's it's not really OSI approved license. So, so in order to combat open washing, we came up with this. Uh, uh, model openness framework. So there's a white paper, you can go read the white paper. And um, there were some, you know, university researchers involved. Uh, one gentleman is from Oxford University, and then we have uh, several people from uh, Generative AI Commons. And then there's one gentleman from University, uh, Columbia University. So they co-wrote this white paper. And basically what it does is it looked at the life cycle of a model, a Gen AI model, and we identify there are 16 components. From a code standpoint, it includes value, evaluation code, pre-processing code, model architecture, libraries, tools, training code, inference code. From a data standpoint, um, there's data sets, evaluation data, sample model outputs, model weights, parameters, model metadata, configuration file. From a documentation standpoint, there's data card, model card, evaluation result, research paper, technical report. So we see all these different components and obviously, you know, OSI approved licenses only you know, support source code. But for data, structured data, we think that CDLA, which is a Linux Foundation uh, license for data, um, we recommend that people use that. And for unstructured content, such as documentation, we recognize the Creative Commons license. And so basically, we just want some legitimate to us from an open source community standpoint licenses, if they're not using any of these licenses, they are using their company's special license, then it's not really truly open. So, and then we looked at those 16 components and then we kind of um, classify them based on how much openness they have. And then, uh, and then we uh, classify them into uh, one of these categories or classes. Um, the base one is called open model and it includes basically model, you know, architecture, parameters, and, you know, all the documentations um, that comes uh, with the license, uh, with the model source code. And then the class two is open tooling. So that includes training code, inference code, evaluation code, et cetera. And the third one, well, which is we call class one, the, you know, the purest, we call it open science. That means everything is open and using open, you know, we qualify the open licenses. So um, this is not perfect. You know, we're still looking for people's feedback and we actually created this tool called MOT, Model Openness Tool. If you go to the website, is it open.ai? So it's a tool that uh, generally uh, we, we, you know, we request model producers to go and input their license information and the tool itself is gonna spit out a badge, uh, you know, a classification of the model. And um, so it's an honor system, self is disclosed tool. And um, like I said, it's not perfect, but it's a good attempt to show the openness of a model. And obviously as we, you know, move forward, we're gonna, you know, be more and more, um, more and more um, precise, but like, for example, the reason I said that is, for example, for model car and data car now, we are just looking for the availability of that particular document. But to be honest, people can put garbage in there, right? So um, moving forward, I think the next thing we're gonna do is maybe we can come up with some sort of standards 
for model car, data car. So it has to be a quality attached to it, not just you know, the availability of that document. So there's more we got to do, and that's it. And here, before I transition the stage to Murray, and um, this, this survey, please fill out this survey. So basically, what we do as part of the Generative AI Commons, we like to find some you know, particular topic that people really want to know answers for. And then we create a survey, and then um, because we have access to uh, like hundreds of people. And this particular survey, uh, the research that we're looking for is how people use Gen AI in their deployment environment, what kind of challenges they see, and, how, and, and where open source plays in that environment. So um, please, uh, we, you help us out, we, are, we help you out. Okay, with that, I'd like to transition the stage to Mer, um, who is leading the open source AI definition. Um, project, and she's been working very hard on this for months. So please help me welcome Mer. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming. I know it's hard to do a policy talk in a technical summit, but uh, it's my impression. Appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to talk about the open source AI definition and also announce our new version that was released today, version 0 0.09. Um, the open source AI definition is created by the Open Source Initiative, OSI, uh, and I'm working for them. And they are the authority that defines open source. Uh, they're a nonprofit, global scope, and focuses the benefit, uh, advocating for the benefit of open source. So for the past two years, OSI has been engaged in a public process to create the open source AI definition or the OSAID. And I'm gonna introduce you to our new version today and also talk to you about the months long co-design process we use to create it. Uh, so first off, co-design, uh, what is this? Uh, it's a set of creative methods for making public decisions with not for directly impacted stakeholders by sharing knowledge and power. And here you have an example of what that can look like. It's small group work. This was at All Things Open last October. You see, um, you can't see the text, but some you know, people taking notes uh, on text for the definition collaboratively. Uh, the first co-design question we had was, uh, we have these um, principles from the Free Software Foundation, use, study, modify, and share. And our first co-design question was, what should these open source principles mean for artificial intelligence? What should the four freedoms look like for OSAI? And so we had three in-person workshops, co-design workshops. Again, small group work. We had two in the US and one in Ethiopia. And here you can see some of the notes are a little more legible. What people thought share should mean for open source AI, what people thought study should mean for open source AI. And of course, we did this for all four of the freedoms. And this is what we came up with, and this is what is in the definition now. So open source AI means the ability to use the system for any purpose and without having to ask for permission, to study how the system works and inspect its components, to modify the system for any purpose, including to change its output, and to share the system for others to use with or without modification for any purpose. So the next question that we wanted to answer uh, through co-design was which components must be open in order for an AI system to be used, studied, modified, and shared, right? So what is the preferred form of an open source AI system? And to do this, we had a virtual co-design process, which is more inclusive than the in-person process because anyone in the world could join. Um, and we, in this group, we had 50% of participants were people of color. 25% women trans non-binary, 30% black, and you can see people publicly gave permission to show their names and affiliations, so you can see the organizations and in some cases the countries that they're coming from, and also the OSI board contributed to the text of the um, preferred form. Uh, this is a little bit about what the actual co-design process was. So we used the components in the model openness framework. Um, you can see them on the left-hand column. I think they might be a little bit different than they are now. This was from an earlier draft, but you can see data preprocessing code, training code, test code, validation code. Um, and then people in the working groups were voting, is it required to use, is it required to study? So what is needed to study, use, modify, and share the system? Then uh, I tabulated the votes to see which components are coming up again and again and again, where stakeholders are saying we need this component. 
to uh, study use, modify, the share the system. Uh, then publicly announcing the results of that work on our forum for people to comment on, and I'll share that link at the end of the presentation. And you can see, I think this is, is from probably March. Um, the components that were required were the training, validation, and testing code, inference code, model architecture, model parameters, supporting tools and libraries for what the stakeholders are saying, this is what we most need. And then uh, sharing a publicly uh, uh, version of the of the definition, this is 06, um, and that is was available for comment, as all versions have been. Um, and you can also see throughout these steps that we have these three types of components, the code, the model, and the data that are coming up again and again, code, model, data. So what does that look like for the current version, 09, that we just releasing? So we are saying that the preferred form of making modifications for machine learning open source AI system must include open weights, which is model weights and parameters, open code, source code used to train and run the system, and data information, detailed information about the data used to train the system. And this is just your quick one page snapshot, what is the preferred form in version 0.0.9, .0 and you can scan that QR code to get the full text. Um, and let's go into some details about that. So weights, as I said, model weights and parameters made available under OSI approved terms. Um, I think there's some question about licensing weights. I know that the MOF has said you can use an OSI approved license, but we'll sort that out. Um, and then there's some examples of the components that could be used to fulfill that requirement. And this also, the examples are in the text of the definition, which is a QR codes at the top still. Code, the sort of code used to train and run the system, made available under an OSI approved license. Obviously, software is something that has uh, OSI approved licenses already in place that you can find on the website. Um, and he's, here are examples of the code artifacts that could fulfill the requirement of source code used to train and run the system. And then data information uh, has a more detailed text. This was one of the most contentious parts of the definition of whether or not training data should be itself part of the preferred form, whether it should be required. And what it is instead is that we definitely believe that the ideal is that training data is shared. Um, but when that is not possible, what does need to be shared is information about the data. Uh, under licenses that comply with the open source definition. And here we're talking about methodology. So you can see the examples, uh, training techniques, uh, provenance, scope, characteristics, how, how data was obtained and selected, labeling procedures, cleaning procedures. And then also you see training data sets used. So when possible, the ideal is please also share the data set itself, um, but is not required. Uh, and I'll go back to this if there's any questions, basically that we affirm the benefits of full access to training data while acknowledging various instances where it's not possible. And we affirm that open training data and public training data are the best way uh, to enable users to study the system. Um, these are some constraints on the final definition, which we're gonna come out with at the end of October. Um, it can't be an empty set. It must be supported by diverse stakeholders. And yeah, we invite you to comment and join the conversation. This QR code will take you to the forum. Um, you can become an OSI member. You don't have to be. It's free to talk. We have virtual co uh, town hall meetings every two weeks. The next one is actually tonight at 11 p.m., which will be super fun for me. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so this is just another snapshot i uh, go back to. Uh, and thank you, and we will do Q&A. So thanks so much. Come on up. Eager to go home. How much time do we have? Yeah, we have time. Two minutes. Um, Stefano. Stefano's the executive director of OSI. Do you want to say something controversial and generate a question?
Yeah. What you expected, not what you expected. Um, obviously, there's we, this is a binary definition. Something's open source or it's not. And then the model openness framework is a tiered definition. So there's obviously different approaches to defining open source. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I actually think that this is necessary, but I do see lots of problems for like companies to adhering to that, um, because like the the one that Meta did with the 3.1, because if they would be open about their data set, they could, there would be problems in using it in the EU, and they are not allowing it, as far as I remember, for using it in the EU. So there's some pr like like a tension field that I don't see to be resolved in, in any meaningful way in the next few months, years, probably. So, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. So, this is why we have the three classes, right? Because we're not saying any class is right or wrong. It depends on your situation. But we want models to be consistent, you know, that's what we're asking for, right? I, I think most of this are qualified for class two, which is the very basic one. Class one is probably academic, you know, research science. Yep. you know is it's a description not you know you don't you are not asking people to show the data open the data I'll let you answer yeah, yeah. Um, go ahead Stefano do you want to say something yeah no I, I think I can clarify also I so meta I, I think meta can actually be an open source AI I, I, without being an open science um, yeah. with with all of that like they First of all, they need to change the, the licensing terms or the, yeah. the, the share and distribution terms for, for the parameters. But what we really want with the open source AI definition is to set the bar at a level where it can be met uh, by at least someone. <laughs> okay. um, and the, the reason why they, if, if Meta has data contained, I mean, the data data set from data contains private information that they don't have the right to reshare to others. Uh, private or copyrighted material that they have the right to crawl, but not to redistribute. And, but if they share the details about how they built their data set, if they share the code of how they've done all the filtering and, and pre-processing and preparing that data set, then society as a whole will not have to re-implement the wheel, the, you know, to restart from scratch all the time. Like someone with a sufficiently, with skills, right? Of course, it needs to be a data scientist and AI developer and a team of that. You know, they will learn and build on top of what Meta has uh, developed. And Meta will keep on having the edge, right? Because yeah, sure. they have more data. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, they will always have more data. They have that machine that ingests and, and generates more data as we go, like Facebook, it's called a machine, data generating machine, yeah. like Google Gmail. Okay. I have a question for 0 0.09 version. So you're saying you just require code for training. So, uh, so you're, you're not requiring code for inference and evaluation? Uh, is that inference and inference is, is funny, right? Because we, 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 we want to have, we want to have a way to run. The, the model, right? Y you need to know where to run it, but it's not necessarily the inference code uh, that was originally developed for, right? All, like, like Llama has been ported to so many different inference engine, <laughs> engines that, you know, as long as you have one or you know the, where you could be running it, I think it's gonna be fine. Practitioners will have to tell it. Like, that's an, another thing that maybe we need to add another slide to, to, to sort of say, like, this is really just the beginning, right? We would not, even if we're going to be releasing a stable release or 1.0 release at the end of October, the, the field is changing so quickly, so rapidly, that I don't think that we, this, this is going to be forever, first of all. And it's not going to, it's not, perfectly fine-tuned 
uh, yet, right? There is a lot of vague interpretation parts because we don't know exactly what is actually necessary in order to comply with the, the objective. The objective is to be able to share it and, and share it with others, study how it works, uh, you know, modify the, the output or modify the behavior of the system. What exactly do you need for each and every single piece of, of um, it, whether it's a GPT or it's, a, it's another type of LLM or if it's a, you know, a computer vision, a neural network or something else like practitioners will have to in, you know, tell us what, what's happening, right? Yeah. Reactions, responses. Actually, he asked, is it legal? Is it, there's a legal aspect to it? And um, I'm, I don't think it's a legal aspect to it, but it's more of a best practice. Licenses, there's a legal aspect to it. For open, not for this one, but for open source definition, there's license attached to it, right? Yeah, so the, the biggest legal issue is on, on data. Because the, the data components are, you need a lot of data. And, when, and data is made of at least three kinds, right? There is public data, there is public data like temperature of the ocean. Right? That's very public, there is, those are facts. You, they don't have exclusive right. No one has exclusive rights on the temperatures of the ocean. They're just facts. Um, then there are data, there is data that is publicly available, like the internet, <laughs> uh, that you can, you can go and crawl, but you don't have, the, you can go and crawl, mm -hmm. but you don't have the right to reshare it to others. And then there is private data. The private data is things like medical data. Those, you don't have the right to share them at all. So,有些数据是有的 很难知道说它里面到底是用什么样的数据去train啊，会不会有一些歧视啊？这这类的一些问题。明白，明白。这好处是什么？我是在benefits。Benefit AI都是用私有的话，那你就是一个黑盒子。黑盒子的话，它里面什么东西也不知道，对不对？那你这个AI是不是可以信任，就很难讲。So he was asking the benefit of you know uh, subscribing to this either uh, MOF or this. I said, um, you, you know, it goes to the openness, right? Why we need openness, right? And obviously, you know, open openness is gonna you know um, um, result in trust. And if there's no openness, you don't have trust. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs>